This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger sits down with Yaakov Katz, who is the former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post and now serves as a senior fellow at the Jewish People Policy Institute. They discuss the Iranian attack on Israel this weekend and where Israel and its response goes from here. Yaakov Katz, welcome to the show. It's great to be with you. Now you're coming to us from Jerusalem, correct? That's right. You had quite a weekend. Why don't you just share with our viewers and listeners where you were on Saturday um, and kind of how you took it all in when Iran launched over 300 ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones into Israel? Well, I was actually supposed to leave Saturday night for uh, the United States. I was supposed to come to Washington, D.C. I was actually, I think you and I, you and I were supposed to meet this week. And I even had my bag packed. I had a taxi waiting for me downstairs. It was about 8.45, 9 p.m. I had a midnight flight. And we hear the news that the IDF has announced that the all schools, all camps, because this now Passover break here in Israel, any gathering is canceled. And I made a couple of phone calls and I understood that, that it's happening now, right? It's, it's coming. And shortly after that, they basically made the announcement at about 9.30, 9.45, that the launch of the drones was already on its way. Shortly after that were the cruise missiles, later were the ballistic missiles. But basically at about 9.05, 9.10, I said, you know what? I can't, I can't go. Not because I'm needed in Israel, but because I felt like I was needed with my family and my kids. And... It was scary. I got to say, you know, we're, we've been used to over the years getting attacked from Gaza. We've been used to getting attacked by Hezbollah. This is the first time that Iran has launched a direct assault against the state of Israel from Iranian territory with drones, with cruise missiles, with long range ballistic missiles. They were all making their way towards here and they flew actually over Jerusalem. We heard interceptions. We heard explosions. We had air sirens. We went down to the bomb shelter at some point about 2 a.m. And I have young kids still. I have an 11 year old and a 13 year old. And they both came to me separately at one point and asked me is, you know, is this the end of us pretty much? Uh, mm. So just just to be able to be here, to be able to give them some confidence and reassure them, I it made me realize I made the right decision. So I was happy about that. But uh, but in the broader scheme of things, this was a historic moment and not in a good way, <laughs> necessarily. For yeah. And, and it's important. Um, your, your children are, are, are no strangers to being in a shelter, tragically, right? This is something that they've experienced before, certainly uh, on October 7 uh, and, and days afterwards. But yet they this felt perhaps, yeah. you felt it was different. Yeah. You know, October 7th, we woke up to the air raid, to the air raid siren at about 830 in the morning. Uh, it was a holiday, so we were sleeping in late and siren wakes up. Sarah Sergeant wakes us up, we go down to the shelter. We didn't know yet what was happening. Take the phone with me and, and figure it out along the way. But this was different because again, this is Iran. And Roger, I think you know this, but like we've been speaking about Iran for, for so many years. One, one, my first book that came out in 2012 was called Israel versus Iran, the Shadow War. I mean, this war with Iran has been there for so long and has been one of these uh, mega threats that Israel has been forced to deal with, but we've only been fighting with the proxies until now. And now to yeah. get attacked from the Iranians, and there are people who have long said they're a paper tiger, they're not as bad as they seem. The interception was, a, you know, the, 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 the coordinated interception and defense was, was remarkable, but, but still it is Iran and it had a lot of buildup in, in the years yeah. until now. No, no doubt. I mean, this, this is absolutely historic. I completely see it the way you do. And, and, and yes, there has been an ongoing war in the shadows between Israel and Iran, and it's been carried out uh, between Israel and, and its proxies, of course, most famous and, and well known infamously, I should say, October 7th. But uh, for uh, years, decades uh, between Israel and Hezbollah um, in, in the north uh, and, and others. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the, the kind of significance, not just that it came from Iranian territory, but uh, as you've written about this, reported on this for years now, the fact that they chose to attack with this 
kind of barrage and mix of weaponry. Uh, and, and, and do it in the following way, Yaakov, both in terms of the volume, right, hundreds, and in terms of the nature of the weapons they're using. Some have dismissed it as, you know, performative. My sense is you don't, you don't view it that way. I certainly don't. But, but talk about uh, both the, where the attack was launched from and the uh, weapons employed. They really, you know, for years, uh, we'll take a step back for a moment. For years, we know that the Iranians have built up a very sophisticated and advanced missile production capability. Right? One of the big mistakes, for example, or the flaws in the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal that Israel long, you know, sounded that alarm bell about, as did others, was that while it dealt with some of the enrichment and some of the other components of the nuclear program, it did nothing for the delivery system. It did nothing for these long-range ballistic missiles. And we saw at least three different kinds, apparently, of the of the ballistic missiles that were launched at Israel. You know, they're so, they have solid fuel ones, they have liquid fuel ones, they have two stage, they have one stage, they got all different kinds, and, and they're it's no, it's no secret that they could strike Israel. That we've known for a long time. They're able to put a satellite into space independently. That definitely gives them the ability to fly a missile within range of Israel and even with non-conventional warheads, which is the greatest fear. But they also used their drones, the Shahad drone, which is a drone that uh, they've pretty much developed uh, domestically. Eh, some say it's been a copy of American designs of different drones over the years, but they, they have it. It's a suicide drone. So basically it's a one-way ticket. Oh, yeah. You go to Ukraine and there's, they have a nice, healthy collection of Shahad drones in Ukraine. I mean, it's, exactly. it's they've been supplying them to the Russians because Russia, by the way, a lot of people don't know this. I actually tell the story in one of my books how Russia, after the war in, in, in Georgia, in South Ossetia, in, in 2008, the Georgians were using Israeli drones, mainly made by Elbit, which is a big Israeli defense contractor. And the Russians came to Israel and said, you know, why are you selling the Georgians drones? We want drones. So they actually, some of their, some of their drones back in about, it's, they started to deliver in 2009, 2010, were actually old generation Israeli drones. Um, you know, obviously that stopped a number of years ago, but because the Russians have always had difficulty developing their own drone capability, they are relying on the Iranians for that. Obviously, they're expecting to get the Iranians are expecting to get something in return that's not just money, and that might be Russian air defense systems and 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 fighter jets, which would make any attack against Iran more difficult. But basically. There is an array of capabilities, and I don't, I don't, you see, I'll tell you, when people say performative, I take an issue with that, because the way I look at it, this was an amazing success, no doubt, right? We intercepted, according to the IDF, 99%, together with the Americans and the British and the French and the Jordanians and, Pasa, and the Saudis who did something as well, although they're keeping oh, the what? <laughs> under, under, under the shroud of secrecy. Um, remarkable. Wow. But we have to look at each of these projectiles, drones and missiles, as if they landed and killed people. Exactly. If, if we don't, what are we doing? We're, we're basically going back in time to the period when we used to say, okay, it's not a big deal. We have Iron Dome. We can defend ourselves from Gaza until one day they wake up, they cross in with thousands of people, and they rape and murder and abduct our people. It accepts the escalation. I mean, if you call if you call this a win, as President Biden reportedly said to Prime Minister Netanyahu, then what you're basically saying is we should now accept Iran's launching of these types of weapons uh, as so, you know, something that is, is a status quo that we can maintain because we could defend against it. That, that's that to me is the definition of that win. I don't think that's a win uh, yeah. that is worthy of spiking the football. It's something we should, well, the United States should encourage Israel uh, to accept, or certainly Israel to accept. Which, which gets to the to the big question right now. Which, of course, I am sure you are uh, in, in conversation with many of of your sources. Which is, will there be an Israeli response? What kind of Israeli response should we expect? Uh, wh what's your view? Uh, what are you hearing? Well. I'll get to that, but I just give me one word about the yeah, definition yeah. of win, because yeah. it, it, it's so important. You know, people, I've heard it from the Biden folks. I heard it from the Canadian foreign minister. I've heard it from other people. There are even Israelis who say this. Now, 
it's it was a success it was not yes. a win a win is when you defeat your enemy a win is when there is a decisive victory we do not we have yet to win in gaza we definitely did not win with iran and the 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 con, the, the concern here is like you said roger very perfectly is that if we don't respond now what we essentially set ourselves up for is for this to happen in two months, in three months, in half a year, in a year, and then we'll be in a in, a, in the place like we are. We we found ourselves with Hamas in Gaza until October seventh, or where we are today with Hezbollah, where we are afraid of Hezbollah and what they could potentially do to us. We cannot allow this to go by. And you know what? I'll just say one other word on that. I grew up in Chicago. Michael Jordan was my kid, was my childhood hero. And what I tell people all the time. The Bulls had a great defense back in the 80s and the 90s, but that's not why they won right. all those championships was because of their defense. They won because they had to go on the offense once in a while. And 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 that's what Israel, in my view, definitely needs to do now. Now, to your question of what, what we could potentially do, I think the, the, the spectrum is wide. On the one hand, there are people who are saying, look, this is the time you go after everything. You take out the nuclear program. You go after Natanz and Iraq and Ishfahan and Boucher and Parchin and Com Fordo, all the different places. And but you take out the of viewers, Yaakov just listed all the places where uh, the Iranians have elements of their nuclear program. Correct. If you're counting, I think that was five or six, and that wasn't exhaustive. Carry on. <laughs> and there's more. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. So um, those are the ones that I know of. I'm sure there's more that, you know, just the intelligence folks know. Of. But um, you go after you go after all of that or you take out at least the key components, you go after the military production, the missile production, you take out key bases and maybe even key infrastructure. That would be, that would definitely lead to a war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, if you want to try to contain it, shot across the bow, make sure you're, it's clear, we will not tolerate what you just did. You could go smaller in scope. You could go after, let's say, the Air Force base from where they launched the drones. You could go after the factory where they create some of these long range ballistic missiles or one of their storage centers or underground silos. You don't have to do all of what I just listed, but then the question really comes down to, so we're just gonna wait. I mean, like, here's the thing, Roger, that I, I have difficulty wrapping my head around, and that is Iran, they're, they're dangerous. They are the greatest generator of chaos and bloodshed today in the world. They are bent on our destruction. They are the supporter and provider of all the proxies that are trying to destroy us. Israel today is attacked on four different fronts. We're the most attacked country in the world. This needs to end. And the October 7th, post-October 7th reality should teach us you can't contain these threats. They have to be confronted and dealt with. So what I'm hearing from Yaakov is there needs to be a response. Clearly what President Biden is advising Bibi Netanyahu it will not be accepted. It can't be accepted. Israel needs to respond to the attack. At the same time, I hear you wrestling with, you're not certain if there is any kind of response beyond perhaps a full out conflict that will get to the root of the problem and, and truly uh, deter them from, from doing this again. Uh, there, there's one other element here, which I want to get to in our, in our remaining time. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest problem between the United States uh, and Israel right now is not whether or not Israel will enter Rafah. <laughs> it's not whether Israel is bent on destroying Hamas versus providing uh, humanitarian aid to Palestinians. Those are issues, no doubt, and, and they're playing on the press. To me, the biggest problem is the disagreement between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government over Iran. Yeah. If there was alignment between Israel and Iran, Israel and, and the United States, of what you just said with regard to Iran, that, hey, they are the driver of this ring of fire and all the instability, and therefore we need to work collectively, you know, whether it was maximum pressure of the Trump years or something new uh, during the Biden years, I don't think you'd be struggling to articulate what Israel can do to deter Iran. The problem is Israel is on its own vis-a-vis -vis Iran because President Biden fundamentally does not view Iran the way that B Bibi Netanyahu and actually all of Israelis uh, left and right view Iran. Give me your take on that. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's even more than that, right? They, they believe in a whole, they believe in the appeasement policy. They believe just more money, more sanctions released, maybe some diplomacy. Yeah, we'll have a call with the G7. We'll take it to the Security Council table. We've been through this over and over, over the last 25, 30 years. What, what America has, has refused to do until now, Trump kind of did that with the targeting of Qasem Soleimani, but, you know, held back from going all the way out. The Bush administration definitely didn't do that. Obama, forget about it. But the Iranians have a strategy and they wait and they distract and they destroy all at the same time, right? They, they try to distract and destroy you by attacking you with proxies. And they really, you know, when I tell people, look, from their perspective, they have, a, they think they have immunity. People are like, why would they launch such an assault against Israel? Don't they think Israel is going to retaliate? I said, no, they're, they're actually quite smart. They, they predicted exactly what's happening, that the French and the British and the Americans and the Canadians and everyone is going to tell Israel, don't do anything. Take a win, even though this isn't a win. So that's been their entire strategy. By the way, it's a similar strategy you mentioned Rafa to Sinwar in Rafa. What yeah. is Sinwar's thought about Rafa? I can survive and hold on there because the world will stop Israel from coming in here. And so far, he's been right. Right. And I think that part of what Israel needs to do, and, and this is going to sound harsh, but part of what Israel needs to do, and, and I, I totally, I believe strongly in the U.S.-Israel relationship. I think it's one of the pillars of our existence here. I think it is of existential importance. However, we might need to have a crisis right now that's even bigger than we have, whether it's on Iran or on Rafah, because we have to show the world and our, particularly the enemies around us, that we're not just another state in the United States. We will do what we have to do because first and foremost is the interest of the state of Israel and the security of the state of Israel. Uh, you know, that makes sense from the Israeli perspective. Uh, the job of a government is, is, is to protect its people, uh, maintain its sovereignty. And uh, if anything, what we've seen is that Israel's sovereignty is under siege, uh, especially so since October 7th and events over the past week in Iran. But there is can, a problem. Can I, can, I, can I just, can I bring, I know that I think maybe at the end of this, you're going to ask me something about a Ronald Reagan. I, I will. I'm, I'm going to get the lightning round real quote here. It looks like you're ready to go right now. No, because it actually it? fits in right here. It fits well, in right I, here. I, I never wanted to interfere with a Reagan quote. Shoot. Okay, I found a quote that he that he said, obviously, a bunch of years ago, um, must have been like, you know, sometime in the mid 80s, you know, Israel exists, it has a right to exist in peace behind secure and defensible borders as a right to demand of its neighbors that they recognize those facts. I've personally followed and supported Israel's heroic struggle for survival ever since the founding of the state of Israel 34 years ago. And then he says in the pre 67 borders. Israel was barely 10 miles wide at its narrowest point. The bulk of Israel's population lived within artillery range of hostile Arab armies. I'm not about to ask Israel to live that way again. And, you know, this was a long time ago. This was in the 80s that Ronald Reagan made this statement, the president. We are living today within the artillery range of our enemies, right? And the world is asking us, Roger, the world is asking us to accept this. As, as the reality, Reagan said back then he would not allow for something like this to happen. I don't know what he would do if he was president today, but, but, but based on this quote, this current reality would not be acceptable to him. Well, it, absolutely. And, and it's the reality in many respects is worse than it was when Reagan was describing, because how many thousands of Israelis are displaced from their homes in the north, north, you know, over 60,000 yeah. uh, because of those missiles and, and, and rockets targeting and firing on, on them. Uh, so it's, it's not simply that there's the potential of the attack. It's, it's actually playing out and you have displaced, displaced persons. Um, you know, here I was going to go, and then we'll, we'll, end, we'll end with this, Yaakov Katz, again, uh, author, security expert, and uh, former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, coming to us from Jerusalem. The problem for Israel is they, of course, need to be a sovereign actor, independent sovereign actor. They're not the 51st state, and they need to do what's in their interest, as you point out but they are absolutely reliant on the U.S. defense industrial base. They are absolutely reliant on U.S. security assistance. And 
no Israeli prime minister can avoid entering that variable into their calculus. And so the escalation that you're describing, right, needs to be considered with, well, how much support can I rely on, whether it's precision guided munitions, whether it's interceptors, the variety of things that are essential to Israel dealing with a multi-front attack, which is not a theoretical matter, Yaakov. It's happening right now. Gaza, Lebanon, and of course now attacks from Iran. So, you know, there's the, what you want to do, what you think you need to do, but you have Democratic senators saying they want to hold back security assistance on the basis of a Rafa operation, let alone what happens if they feel there's an escalation that they're not willing to accept from Israel in response to Iran. Give me your take on that. What I say to people often, it's a very good question, is that people talk about precision guided munitions and, and aircraft and all that stuff. All America needs to do is close the valve on spare parts for our fighter jets and our helicopters and our transport aircraft. Everything we fly in the air pretty much is American made. We have one trainer from Italy. That's it. Everything else is U.S. F-15s, F-16s, F-35s, Apaches, Blackhawks, um, UNC-130s, you name it. Now, you can't fly if you don't have a regular supply of spare parts, and you need a lot of spare parts when you're at war. But I have to say, you know, when I, when I, when I saw the picture on early Sunday morning here in Israel come out of Prime Minister Netanyahu's phone conversation with President Biden, where apparently Biden said to the Prime Minister, take a win, and I didn't know what, he, what, what Netanyahu had replied at that point, I thought back to another phone call that I had written about in, in, in my last book about the bombing of Syria's nuclear reactor in 2007. Then it was George W. Bush, and it was a different, he was the president, Omer, Ehud Omer was the prime minister. And Israel had asked the United States, after bringing the intelligence about this nuclear reactor that North Korea was building for Syria, that uh, America take action and bomb it. Bush deliberated with his team, national security guys, and they came out with the decision, we're not going to do that. We're going to go, we're going to go to the national, to the UN. We're going to go to the Security Council. That was that phone call in July of 2007. And Ehud Olmert said to him, Mr. President, unacceptable. If you won't do it, we're going to do it. We, I am the Prime Minister. I am responsible for the fate and survival of the Jewish people. And that was a moment that, you know, you, you could go back, and you know these people, you go back, you talk to Steve Hadley or, or Elliot Abrams, the National Security Advisor and the Deputy at the time, and they were sure that the President was going to put down the phone and say, who the hell does this Israeli guy think he is, right? But on the other, but really what he did was he put down the phone, he said, I respect that guy. And, and you need to have a strong foundation of respect between a President and a Prime Minister to have those tough conversations. I think that unfortunately today we don't have that ability. And that's why your question is so important. The relationship today is not at the level, I guess, that the prime minister could say that to the president. And that's that, unfortunate. Yeah. That, that's a great point. And that might be the biggest vulnerability right there. Exactly. You know, it's, it's partners, allies need to have a trust relationship where they can get through even moments when they disagree. You mentioned Omert and Bush uh, with respect to the nuclear program in Syria, you know, you, you referenced President Reagan, you know, Osirik with Begin exactly. uh, was carried out and, and President Reagan was not happy uh, right. that it was done unilaterally. But those partners, though, that the, the, the alliance, the partnership, uh, you know, was able to, to, to manage through those difficulties. I don't think we have confidence uh, that the Bibi Netanyahu, Joe Biden relationship is strong enough to, to traverse what will unquestionably be uh, really difficult, uh, uh, more difficult times ahead. Yaakov Katz, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.